was, yeah, it was uh, destruction there, but it's clear the fact that he's repeated this line that he doesn't blame the opening for it. And uh, he's found something else to come back with it. Uh, when you talk about the night off, anybody who wants to start playing the night off, I mean, this is the guy that you want to look at. These, his are the games that you want to study. So I'm a That's little right. surprised at the fact that Maxime has already started taking some time. Yeah, you're right. But speaking about gurus in the night off, if you really want to start playing it, of course you study mainstream theory, what's happening nowadays, but it's also good to take a look back at the champs of the past. Let's not forget that two of the greatest players of all times, perhaps even, you know, the two main players, that's Bobby Fischer and Gary Kasparov, had the Nidorf as their main weapon against E4. So it's really worth studying those games as well, because you're going to learn a lot just from the point of view of the pawn structure, ideas, thematic maneuvers, and so on. It's not just about theory. I mean, Night of is such a complex opening that yes. it doesn't come down just to concrete lines, but to whole ideas, setups. And, you know, like the feel for the black squares, that's very important in the night of black basic plays for the black squares, squares, whether he goes E7, E5 or not. Even here you can see he played H6 and G5, so trying to gain control of this complex of squares. And this is usually crucial. These are things you need to understand and feel. And just by studying opening the opening theory, you're not, you're not really gaining that feeling. So you need to analyze complete games. I think this is the beauty about Nidoff. Most of us believe that, you know, it's an opening with lots of tactics and, and it's all about checkmating each other, mm. the sacrifice in C3 and these kind of things. But actually, Nidoff is so much more filled with positional ideas and concepts and stru understanding of structures. And this is what Maxime grasps really well. You're right. It's a combination. Because what you're saying is right, but it also requires at critical moments to calculate very precisely. Concretely. So you need to be good here and there and even here and there. So you <laughs> Which need is to why I never play the night off. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on? What's going on? So he's played b5 and he has taken on h4 after all. So uh, a bit perhaps surprisingly uh, because Alejandro m said that perhaps rook c8 in this position would have been uh, perhaps more natural. But uh, Maxime did not hesitate too long before taking on h4, bishop takes and now going b5. Uh, it's very likely the rook is going to come on this semi-open file, rook c8 at one point. This is more or less where it belongs. And um, still looking a bit uncomfortable as he sat there. And, I mean, his it, he just went into such a long consideration about what to do, even picking up one of the pieces that uh, I think it was a pawn and kind of banging it on the table just a little bit, a little bit of nervous tension, not loudly, but just his hands moving really, really fast. And MVL with this, this kind of absolute confidence like I put a wall in front of you and I think I'm gonna be doing just fine and then the committal move F4 finally by Magnus and when he played it MBL didn't move at all he was leaning back in his seat like this and didn't move didn't budge he just stared at the move F4 for a while before finally playing this move B4 Magnus is knight now chased over to the A4 square and I think I see Queen C7 on the board so a hugely committal move that move f4 by magnus after quite a long think he's not down big time on the clock or anything but he doesn't seem hyper comfortable in the way this game has proceeded so we'll see we know mdl is a knight of specialist par excellent there's no question about it that he will be looking to show that you don't walk into my knight or if you're trying to win you really have to be very well prepared to take on MBL in the night off. Yes, Alejandro. Well, we have some updates in another game. Jan Nepomniachi versus Ding Lirer and Jan with the black. Don't like Maxime's position. I think you're right, Alejandro. And the explanation of Rook B8 is probably this knight A5 move. That was his plan, I guess. But as you pointed out and explained, um, it doesn't seem to be sufficient for Maxime. His only advantage, perhaps, the clock.
he's got like six minutes, a six minute advantage, which is something important, but not as important, of course, as what, what's happening on the board. So, um, looking at what's happening on the board here, Yannick, I mean, I'm just trying to understand how black can continue the attack because, like you said, bishop d7 is an idea, but it's not possible because of bishop e7. Can black go back with queen c7 with the idea to go bishop d7? Actually, I think this is more or less what he should do. Something, I mean. Alejandro said passive earlier, but maybe he has to acknowledge that his attack is going nowhere and he, you know, must pull the break and Queen C7 is a possibility, although he has to take into account Bishop takes A6, which may be risky, of course. Maybe there is even Bishop F6, oh, interesting. which could be an idea, but, well, I don't know, um, F5 is looming at some point with H6 in the air. I mean, like, if I'm bishop f6, you just go bishop e2. Just bishop e2. And uh, after bishop e2, I just don't see a move. The oracle has spoken, and it seems to be irresistible. Yeah, uh, you have f5, isn't there? Yeah, f5. Well, I have I got a day. What's going on after knight f2? Nine, what, Rook h4? What am I missing? Sorry? Bishop knight. h4? Yeah. Rook h4? Yes. Mm, oh god, the way you're saying yes, you already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Knight f2 just gets crushed by F5. queen d4. Oh, queen d4, yeah. Queen d4 hits your rook oh, on h8. Oh, this is amazing. Mm, double attack. And you can, you're losing the rook on b8, you're losing everything yeah. in this mm. position. But it's the same story if in this position after b3, uh, bishop f6, bishop here. If you even play the more sedate, just going back here, I play same move, queen d4. And your king is unsafe, f5 and e5 are your ideas. I can't just double on the h file and take your pawn. It all comes down to the same idea. If black doesn't have the counterplay, he's already strategically lost. I'm losing everywhere. And every other set has played a much better move, is uh, moving back the queen mm. to c7. But the question is can I simply grab this pawn, say I'm up a pawn, this is an important one? It, yes, it opens up the a file, it's a little bit risky. But does black really have compensation for it? Of course, that's not the only good move. I can just play the move bishop e2 again, harassing this knight on g4, and Magnus is in the driver's seat. Well, it's, he seems irresistible. He's played c4 twice yesterday on, on move one, and he's won pretty uh, convincingly. And now he just says, okay, Maxim, knight of specialist, let's see. <laughs> let's yeah. see what it's about. And I like, I like <laughs> queen c7, but I really like the fact that Magnus has gone for bishop a6. E2. I think we have bishop a6 on the board. He's, He's we, played bishop e2. Oh, okay, yeah. He's played bishop e2. Bishop a6 would have been a commentator's dream. <laughs> yeah, we want we want blood, but we, I'm afraid we're gonna get French blood here. Now I'm just thinking, can we go bishop d7? Bishop because this was the idea. Yeah, I, it's so difficult to find a good advice um, for uh, the poor Maxim. But bishop d7 looks like maybe it was the idea to play queen c7 to defend my d6 pawn sure. against bishop e7. And the question is whether he wants to go back to b2, but it feels a bit unnatural. What else can he play? Candidate moves. Because the problem with a move like moves. knight b2, uh, Yannick, if you can have that on the board, knight b2, for example, is mm -hmm. that after bishop c3? Yeah. Unless I'm missing something simple, is that the queen just doesn't seem to have a have a reasonable square here? Let's. Go. And now knight e3. Play some moves, and I'm going to get counterplay eventually on that a line. But maybe the counterplay doesn't work out. Who knows? It's not easy to calculate anything specific. And of course, the engines are saying counterplay, schmounterplay. I don't care about that. Magnus, however, says no. I've got to make sure I stay practical and keep that flow and not give him shots at me. So he played a move that really is quite shocking. The move f5, very specific move giving away all the dark squares. You just look at the dark squares, just light up. Black's eyes would be like, are you kidding? Bishop back to d7. And then the move, bishop takes g4, and the very brute force mate threat, queen to g5. That's it. I'm threatening mate on e7, and I'm threatening to take your pawn on g4. Of course, you can stop the mate with bishop to f6, as he's now contemplating. But you're losing the pawn on g4, and will you have enough play? It looks like bishop takes on a4 is going to happen, and Magnus will have a compromised king. So let's just play a move. Bishop f6, queen takes on g4, and now bishop takes 
on A4, and we could go down this line after a trade, yet another trade, and EF6, B takes on A4, and look at this position. It's a mess. You could just pick up pawns. It looks like somebody actually just said, let's just pick up some pawns and throw them down on the chessboard and see where they land. It's a hot mess, but white is up a pawn right now, and we see this position is actually coming to fruition. Is White's king, though, too weak, and also the pawn's too weak for him to make any claim to advantage in this line? Did Magnus go for something that really is not going to work out for him, as it just looks like, yes, we're, we're both weak everywhere, but your extra pawn, I'm not even sure which one we point to to say this is the pawn. And I find his position to be really solid, as we've described before. And in this position, Magnus just played queen e2. Not so much has happened since we left these guys. And I, I think Magnus is now trying to activate his rook. I'd, I'd go to d5, you know, keeping an eye on a5, and perhaps trying to go to b5, trying to reroute the queen perhaps to the center, back to d5. He, you know, the black king is quite solid quite secure, but it's still not impossible to, to try and get to it with rook b5, rook b7. But in a way, I still, I still think that, that Maxime's position is solid enough. And um, I have to say that black seems like he'll be doing fine as long as he keeps the pressure on white's pawns, whether it's c2 or g2. I like to move rook g8 because it really makes sure that white's queen is not able to enter the attack with, you know, moves like queen a5 or like queen a6, or like you suggested, rook d5, and try and come into the attack. Black's a pawn down, but I don't think it matters enough in this position. Well, actually, he's a pawn down, but we don't really notice it when we look at the position. And you, you, you said putting pressure against the pawns, he has targets, yes. g2, but also e4 is a little, I mean, it's a backward pawn. It's, it's not placed badly, but it's a backward pawn, so it's, potentially it's vulnerable, a4 as well. So he can put the queen on c6 and try to maneuver. There is also some pressure, perhaps, potentially on the c file. If, if the queen goes, the white queen goes too far, the, queen, the rook can go back to c8. I mean, to me, it looks like dynamic balance here. So I'm trying to look at some concrete variations and see why I can actually follow up with the plan you suggested. So let's say I go rook d5. Yeah, but for the moment, Maxim has to find a move. But we can say, basically, he, he's going to... Let's say he plays a yes. decent rook g3. And let's say rook d5. Rook d5. So my idea is to try to go queen d2, rook to b5 and queen d5, but it looks like it's going to be way too long. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. I, I, I find it difficult for white to, to concretely improve the position. I mean, So what would be with... black's move right now? Well, you can perhaps wait with a... So let's say you wait. Rook and I c3. say I go queen d2. Queen d2. You have the other uh, idea that black could have is something like rook a3, queen c4 as well, which could be very interesting. Right, let's try that. Looks good. Rook a3 here. And if I play queen d2, the one you want to play, then I want to queen go queen c4. c. Uh, yes. Yeah, that doesn't so look good. He can't do that. So he should start with uh, perhaps rook b5. Also, another interesting line that we could show instead of rook b5 is a move like queen b5. Now you've got control or queen a6, you've got control over c4, but black has rook a2 now. Yeah. Just immediately Maybe finishing five, the game. That's right. Probably just have that on the... So rook a2. And here I'm not blundering the rook. No, you're not. <laughs> it's a perpetual indeed. So queen king a2 just queen runs it. Oh, wait, there's probably... Is there oh, more? is it more because of b3? b3. Ah, <laughs> we wanted to make a draw, but we <laughs> suddenly Hopefully discovered... Hopefully this position ever came on my discovered. board, I will find b3. <laughs> yes, puzzle rush again. <laughs> no, I mean... It's not easy for white, definitely. It's not easy to improve the position. So, yeah, like we've got some moves on the we've board. Let's just moves. update and see what True. happened. Oh, has that happened? Oh, wow. Oh, well done, <laughs> Tanya. <laughs> this makes me very happy. Okay, so, so... he did go rook g3 and rook a3, and now the queen is really stuck on f2, defending the c2 pawn against the threat of rook a2, and I've got queen c4 coming in. So instead of rook d5, he went queen f2, and we had... Rook a3, oh. the move you wanted to play and has appeared on the board, well done. And it's true that the, the, the white queen is actually tied to the defense of c2. Because of that trick you showed, rook takes a2 in some lines, which can happen if c2 is not protected well enough. And my threat is queen c4, because you don't even have... But you probably will always have these queen a7 ideas, so you, you're not really in danger. But you know queen a7 is king f8, king g7. The black rook king... g1. 
So my rook will come into play then. You have a still a pawn on g2. Oh! There's no check. Oh. That's sometimes the this problem of having too many pawns. <laughs> <laughs> so this I missed. On e7 it's very safe, but if you're trying to get from the from the left side, for the queen side, you can still try yeah. and hide on, on g7 under certain circumstances. You can be very safe as well on g7. So in fact, white doesn't have a perpetual, which means you that know. he will have to be careful. And he's gone for... I like it. I, I, I started really correct? liking this position for black in general. So G4 really looks like a very good move to me. Yeah, because he G4? wants to open a bit and try. So what happens after Queen C4? Queen C4, I can defend the pawn on A2. I'll let you puzzle rush that. <laughs> so Queen C4, and you're just going to play. You can defend the pawn on A2. Not with you have to. Like okay, it's not C3. Of course, yeah, of it's, course not it's not C3. Okay, you play check, check, and queen, and queen D5. D5. Right? Queen D5. Mm -hmm. So king F8, queen A. And, and that's very D5. dangerous for black because yeah. once the yeah. queen reaches D5, you can see that this pawn on D6 is basically dead in many end games. Mm. You can't really trade the queens, but now the coordination is a little bit lost. The queen on C4 has to move. The rook on A3 is not doing so great. G5 will come at some point. Black has to be a little bit more precise than that. Queen C4 is actually not a very good move. He has a very unusual move. Instead of the move queen C4, the engine really likes the move queen C5, trying to oh, wow. trade off the queen, saying that if you move the queen off of that diagonal, now maybe I can play the move queen c4 we already know that you can't just go anywhere with the queen because of the trick of rook takes a2 but queen takes c5 it just leads to a more or less drawn end game according to the engine and it's not so obvious to me but the engine does say it's a draw and this might be the correct way for the frenchman to continue yeah i'd like to to take a or speak generally about end games in in uh, in the sicilian because they are normally i mean that's a general rule with many exceptions but normally Black is quite happy to get an endgame in those typical Sicilian pawn structures um, because normally he has one more pawn in the center. Usually you have this d6, e6 or d6, e5 pawn structure. So it's one more pawn in the center. And in, in, in the endgame, that's pretty important. Uh, here, I mean, to be more concrete, perhaps we can imagine a move like rook to d5 um, and maybe something just like this this and king d6 maybe it's probably wise well no king d6 is probably a bit, a bit dumb because of the check on d5 so just go back to the a3 the other option was to even just keep your c5 pawn with something like rook c3 i think that's the option right but i i wanted to have this because now you know i can kind of try and get active to g3 and e3 and i i find it hard for white to devise a plan where you can make any progress here. The only problem with, for example, the idea of going for rook g3 and grabbing the g4 and e4 pawn is that you have to be really careful for not losing your a5, b4, That's because true. those two pawns on the king side are worth nothing. So you have to try and keep the balance. Yeah, rook c3 actually looks very decent as well. You and know, you've got a threat of rook c4 now. Yeah and play what the position demanded but instead if you try to play safe with these players thinking that you know at least you will not get checkmated the thing is that they're still going to find small advantage on the board and make life very difficult for you it's true because if you don't try and put your opponent under pressure as the position demands then your opponent finds it easier yeah perhaps it's equal and if you play well you're gonna hold the balance but I mean Amin has been under pressure throughout the tournament psychologically especially so by releasing tension he kind sort of makes Nakamura feels very comfortable already like after 10 moves like after the train of Queens and as I said I mean uh, Nakamura is very good as in these positions this as uh, so you can see this move rook d5 coming on the board this rook on b4 okay it finally got a little bit in play but it cost the pawn that he took so it didn't really make sense to do that. He didn't gain anything from it. And now the sacrifice. Pawn on e5, rook on d5. How do you defend this guy on e5? He's paramount to the defense. You cannot lose this pawn. I mean, rook a4 was just such a shocking move. I mean, you have to yeah. you have to understand that g5 is so dangerous for the king. Are you? And for yeah, I, sorry to interrupt. I was going to, to refer to our dear Yaz Serovan, who tends to say, you have to speak to your pieces when you play. And what is the rook on a4 saying? You completely shut, yeah, you took a pawn, but you completely shut out of the game. And whenever it, it opens, whenever the center blows up, this rook is just outside, and he needed to play b3 
in order to bring it back. But look at the price. I mean, rook d5. What does he have to do? He has to play e4, perhaps. Oh, but e4 shuts your rook from the fourth <laughs> rank. And then I'm simply going to ask the question after queen h5. How do you defend from my main in one threat? Probably you can't. You just can't. Yeah. That's oh the mm. Queen h5 didn't work on the previous move because it's still rook, rook h4, h4 gave True. some semblance of an idea, but it's still winning. But I mean, winning. even that with queen g5, because you don't have a perpetual after rook h1, I've got just king b2, so queen h5 is a big threat. Yeah, and this king f8 move He's is not going to particularly help so you. what happens with queen h5 now? Well, queen h5 is winning, queen d1 is winning, queen d3 is made in 6. Oh, wow. I mean, every move yeah. that Magnus can choose is just is, completely winning. This what is a weird move. completely crazy. I mean, like, Maxime was doing so well. You know, he, he was playing in the spirit of Nidoff, had this really great position, and then messed it up. And this reminds me of something that Magnus said in one of his interviews, where that if you're playing your best chess, your opponents are just automatically playing worse, and things are just falling into place. Well, that's yeah, that's no secret. I mean, uh, if your opponent plays all, all the good moves, then you're not going to win if you play also all the good moves. But one mistake is enough, and this is what happened here. Uh, Queen but h5 on the board, rook very h4. Careless. And this is just crushing. I mean, the king on f8 is a permanent weakness, more than one way to win. This is one of the many ways you had to win the game. Uh, the computer's basically announcing mate. Doesn't Everywhere. matter what you play. Every year. I mean, Everywhere. there's just rook h1 and king g8. Otherwise, how do you defend against? Or you've got, yeah. No, and they just resign. And that's it. It's yeah. game over. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, one careless moment. I mean, this after g4, he 